Welcome to Rick's Corner. Today I have a very, very special guest who's been around a long, long time, and he's very well known through bodybuilding circles and powerlifting and weightlifting and fitness and nutrition, and he's always ripped, and it's Clarence Bass. Clarence, it's my pleasure to have you here on my show. I've been waiting for months. <laughs> but here you are. Thank you very much. It's my honor to be with you. Oh, I'm honored to have you. You know, you and I aren't that different in age. I just turned 71 on Sunday, and uh, the miles add up. Am I right? That's what I was telling Carol. It's going to be two old farts blowing smoke at each other. <laughs> Let me ask you a question before we get into your beginning. Do you have any joint problems at all? Not really. I've been careful to avoid things that hurt. And I, I do have a hip replacement, but I think that was mainly caused by a uh, hereditary curvature in my in my back. Okay. To put a little extra stress. I think that I would have had to have the hip replaced earlier if I hadn't been training. That's true. You know, I, I talk to these young guys nowadays, and a lot of the, the younger generation really wants to know about the days that we were training back in the 70s and the 60s, and because that was the groundwork for bodybuilding back then. And there was powerlifting and Olympic lifting, and of course we all were guilty of going heavy and and putting demand on the joints. And then as you age. Um, they don't have to even get that old. I've talked to guys in their 30s, their joints are killing them. Heavy workouts pull damage on your joints. There's no question about it. Well, you do have to make adjustments. Yeah. You see that things that aren't working, you can almost always find a way to, to train around it. Absolutely. Uh, like I have a problem with stenosis in my lower back, so I avoid things that cause pressure on my back. But I found that there's still plenty of ways to work my lower back, my hips, and, and my 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 hamstrings and so yeah. I'm I feel like I'm not missing anything. You have to think about it and try to work around it. I agree with you. Spinal stenosis is very common. I was told I had it uh, like last year, which is basically the narrowing of the spine, which affects the nerves that go into your legs and of course it makes it difficult to walk sometimes. Um, there's good days and bad days. We all get them. When you started training, you began at what age? About thirteen. That was your uh, what what prompted you to want to do this? Did you have what went through your head and say, you know what, I'm gonna start working out. And my dad was a was a was a track athlete when when he was young. And he he grew up in a little town up in northeastern New Mexico called Cimarron. Yeah. And he was the whole team all by himself to track meet. He was a high jumper, a broad jumper, a pole vaulter, a discus thrower, and he actually placed second in the state track meet all by himself. Wow. And when he was fourteen years old, he won this won the state high school track meet in in the in, uh, in the high jump, and I was an admirer of his of his medals. I just even by the time I was a little kid, I'm sure he brought a barbell home when when I was about in the fifth grade. Yes, that got me started. Actually, he didn't use it very much, but I, but I started using it. And I never stopped. Did you know anything about? Did you just know the basics at the time? What to do with the barbell? I mean, I know I started on a barbecue bench with a barbell because that's all I had, and barbecue bench would kill my back to lay on, but. We all had our own little thing. Did you have any sort of routine that you followed, or did you just play it by ear? I frankly don't remember what that routine was. Yeah. Of course, my dad had a sense of overload and what you needed to do to get stronger. And right. I suppose I mimicked him. But I, I don't really remember that. Um, he, and it's interesting that he taught himself to pole vault by reading it in a book. So maybe I inherited some of those Genes well, to be able to you out you probably I, did. Um, back in those days, uh, it was kind of more like trial and error. I mean, you see an Olympic press or military press and a bench press, and you think, okay, I'll do those things, right? And then those things escalate into other movements around that. And then you just kind of create a routine of your own. My dad also brought me home a copy of Strength and Health magazine, introduced me to that. So I had that to go by. Exactly. My interest turned to Olympic lifting fairly early. Yeah. And of course, the focus of strength and health was uh, was Olympic lifting. So there was a lot of articles in there that I was reading. Yes. And uh, that got me going there. I have a collection of those sitting right over here on my shelf from 1941. Uh, somebody gave them to me when I was in the Army. I've had them. I won't get rid of them. They're like Bibles to me. I love to look through them. There's so much good information back then, and the guys had such great bodies. And, it, you know, it was basic. It wasn't into the hardcore drugs nowadays of just diet and training. Um, about your diet back then, did you know how to eat? Did you experiment with something, or just were able to eat anything? Another thing that and I always say that picking up that barbell when I was in the fifth grade, it just set the course of my life. 
Yeah. And it, it taught me that if you set a goal and you map out a reasonable plan and work at it, that you can achieve that goal. And when I was in high school, I think when I was a sophomore, uh, the fellow across the street ran one, one a competition called the pentathlon in high school. And I remember I went to a, put a, an assembly, a school assembly, and I saw him get the award for that for that win. It was a fitness contest. It's push-ups, chin-ups, bar reach, bar vault, and a, and a shuttle run. Yeah. I made up my, my mind that, that I thought I could do pretty well and that I responded to the weight training and that I... I thought, you know, if I worked at it and go out for that, I was going to win. Yeah, and sure. Here I did win. So that that caught, that set that the pattern there that if you set a reasonable goal, you work at it. I won every event except the shuttle run, and I, I still don't like running very much. But. <laughs> Neither do I. But that's, you know, it's kind of a well-rounded athletic performance when you do something like that. If you can do all those things, of course, it makes you feel better what you do. Uh, what made you center in on bodybuilding? All right, so let's go back about nutrition. So you you had a, a knowledge of nutrition anyway, right? Yes, I got the basic nutrition in that high school class. And then this is what you followed. You know, now, with your books and you're ripped, and you just stay ripped all the time. Do you ever eat any carbs? Oh, yes. I, I think carbs are important, yeah. but I eat whole food carbs. Of course, I didn't know anything about cutting carbs. The, the low carb diet was, yeah. I hadn't heard anything about that until I was well in almost 40. Really? How'd you, how'd you attain such uh, lean, muscle, uh, lean fat and, and such thin skin and still have that muscle mass? Well, my idea has always been to eat a, a whole food diet. And I think it's important not to let yourself become hungry or feel deprived. And when I got down to my, my lowest body weight, I was never hungry or felt deprived. I never felt any urge to overeat after the contest or the show. Right. And I think because I've eaten a balanced diet, healthy foods, and, and I, my, I, I eat up, I, I developed this after a while, but. A, a uniform diet where I eat basically the same thing each day. So instead of counting calories, I'm just weighing myself weekly. Mm -hmm. and I need to adjust. I make very small changes. So it is small changes, no drastic dieting. And and when I when I was weighed underwater for the first time after I'd been training, riding my bicycle, I guess I was about 37. I was 2.4 percent body fat. So oh, wow. what I was doing was working. Well, when you say a whole food diet, you mean you eat everything. The potatoes, meat, vegetables, a whole ball of wax. Well, I do focus on whole grains, fruits, yeah. and vegetables. Okay. My proteins comes mainly from milk and eggs and fish. Okay. Of course, this has been developed over a long period of time. Yeah. I think just the, I don't, I don't, I wasn't thinking about that, particularly the role of the fish at that time. Right. But I'm eating a balanced diet. I wasn't emphasizing protein or de-emphasizing carbohydrate, I try to balance. Okay. I, I wrote in my first book about ripped, trying the, the low-carb diet, and how terrible I felt. I couldn't think. I couldn't train. Sure. Um, there, I, there's a section in there called uh, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Missile, Mr. Hyde. Yeah. Dip, when I added the carbohydrates back into my diet, it was a nectarine went off, and when I came back, everything was okay again, so I never went back to the low-carb diet after that. Well, let me ask you a question, because you know today's bodybuilder, they deprive themselves of carbs for I don't know how many weeks out before a show, and they do get ripped. Now, if they ever eat the whole food diet like you were, they most likely, a lot of them, wouldn't get as ripped as you were. Am I right? I don't think so. I think my approach is a lifetime approach. It's not just one contest. Yes. And I think why I've been so successful keeping my body fat down is because I have eaten this balanced diet, healthy diet, no extremes yes. anywhere. And the mistake I made early was I cut fats too much. And when I added fats, that rounded my diet out, made my cholesterol and triglycerides a lot better. Yeah, I think that fats are a necessity. Well, the, you know, you look around today and, and there, you know everybody trains for a contest or they do what they do, but... Uh, the lifestyle, bodybuilding was a lifestyle back in the 50s and 60s. It wasn't about a contest. You were in shape all year round. You ate good all year round. But today it's not like that. You know, everybody wants to be huge. And um, what's your views on bodybuilding today? These 300-pound guys competing. I don't find that attractive. Do you? 
No, I think that's a turnoff. Uh, of course, I could ne never achieve that much muscle anyway, but they're doing a lot of things that are harmful, I think, to get that way. Well, I, I just think people are not turned on. They're turned off by it. Right. Well, let me put it this way. You and I both could achieve that if we did the right chemicals. We just choose not to. I'd rather be healthy at my age and not have to worry about going to the doctor to have something terribly wrong with me from doing all that. But I don't think they think about it. I don't think they think of the repercussions, what could happen down the road, um, because they're obese. I mean, they, they're 300-pound men walking around like elephants. And even Arnold had said, you know, this isn't attractive anymore. And it's really not. You know, the slim waist cut body is certainly more attractive. So I think your your approach at it is what most people want to see and hear. I know that with my show, people call me all the time. Oh, we like the golden era, the 70s bodybuilder. It's so much more pleasing than today's. But you're always going to get those select few of guys that are extreme and they want to go overboard. You're not going to stop it, you know. But I think your approach is perfect. And, and uh, you, you've proven it over the years. I mean, this, this proof is with you. It's there. I, I had a photo shoot by Chris Lund. He was had almost all of the training shots in muscle and fitness for a while. Yeah. And I went out and we photographed all day long and we went to eat in the evening. Yeah. And I didn't splurge. I did have a dessert. Maybe I had two desserts. I don't know. But I didn't feel any urge. And he, he said, I've never seen anything like this before. Everybody's stuffing themselves after after we take the, the after we have to do, do the shoot. Yeah. But I didn't feel any urge. And I think that's been one of my one of the reasons why I've been successful over a long period of time is I'm what I eat. I enjoy what I eat. I enjoy the training. I think that's the key to a long-term approach. Yes. Do you uh, do you eat desserts now? Not regularly. I eat a dessert when I go out. Yeah. I don't. I you know, if you go out and a nice dessert, there's nothing wrong with that. But as a general rule, I don't eat desserts. No. I found it better if I split my dessert with my girlfriend rather than I eat the whole thing and then I have a couple of little tastes and I'm good to go. I don't need all that stuff to go down my stomach. Where years ago, you know, we had our junk day, I would eat all day Sunday and think, no, I can't do this anymore. It made me sick. It's just not healthy. Um, how many days a week do you train now? I only have two main workouts a week. One hard weights, yeah. one hard aerobics. And I, and, I, and I stay active between times. I'm, I walk regularly. I'm active. But these are hard workouts. Yeah. And I, I, I was working out three times a week, which was those two workouts and one more, which was a combination workout. But I dropped the combination workout because I felt like I wasn't recovering quite enough. So this, there's a, I work out on Tuesdays. My, my weight workout Saturday is my aerobic workout. And these are the... The aerobic workout is not a lot of running and stuff. It's it's high intensity intervals. It's very yeah. short, very hard. So it takes a while to recover from that. If you train hard, you got to rest longer in order to recover. Well, that was a question I had because I have a lot of people. And I'm sure you do too in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. Mostly 50s and 60s, even 70s. So say, geez, I'm back in the gym. I've been training for years, but I'm tired all the time. I can't make any progress. Maybe I'm training too hard. Because when you train for years, you you, you have a tendency to overtrain. And I know I always did. And my kids say, oh, you work out way too hard. You don't need to go seven days, six days a week. I probably don't. But I have the time in the morning to go and do something. If I don't do the weights, I do the bike or something else. But there comes a time in your life when you reach a certain age, you do need to cut back. Am I right or wrong? No, I think that's absolutely right. I was doing, I've been big into, into indoor rowing. Yeah. Concept two rower and also the skier. And I was doing that every weekend. Yeah. But I, and this is a relatively recent change. I, I felt like that I just wasn't recovering. So now I'm doing that every two weeks. So I, so I do eat this, the rower and the skier every two weeks. And just recently, I, I came back and I tried something and I was better. I, I, I feel sure that that was a good change. You talk to most rowers, they think, you know, that's completely nuts. They got to row every day. But of course, I, that's just part of a total training program, a balance program with weights and other things that I'm doing. But I think I'm doing a lot better by doing it every two weeks, which just sounds completely insane. But, but it's certainly working for me. I don't know if it's really insane. I think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, I'm one to believe that, let's just say I'm stuck on the computer trying to do something and I can't figure it out and I'm batting my brain. I'll take a break and leave for an hour. And then all of a sudden after I have that rest period minute, I come back and I figure it out. It's the same thing with a workout. Take a few days off, 
oh yeah, or you feel like you're like falling apart and you're really not. And you go back to the gym and say, Jack, I feel so much better. So I think what you're doing, I think is right. It's actually the way it works. And you know you've done it. What you say about getting up and moving around is very important. I've written a number of things. In fact, just one recently about a recommendation that came out of the UK about when people during the work day, they should be up and moving around ideally one half of the time. Yes. Work eight hours, four hours. So I, 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 I get up and when I'm writing or something, and I just, I've got all the material in my head, but I can't quite put it together. So I'll go for a walk. And it seems like I, I, I don't have to get more than a block, and it starts all coming in. I, and I've had that happen over and over and over. Yeah. People think, well, you're wasting time. You should sit there and grind it out. But no. that's not right. You've got to you make you get the blood to your brain. There are other things, I think, that are going on. Yes. But it makes you more creative. In fact, I've written an article about people that walk are more creative about a study. So there's a lot of things demonstrating that these things are absolutely true, the things that you found out from experience, and I did too, and now we're just finding out just why. They can analyze what's going on in the brain, what parts of the brain are, are working, what there's something called the brain-derived neurotropic factor, which is developed by walking mainly, and it, it allows your, your brain to create more connections if they, they put a brain cell in a petri dish in the, in, the, in the laboratory, pour this stuff on it, they can just see the brain cells sprouting connections. I'll be darned. So the, the exercise is critical in terms of mental function. That's very interesting. My girlfriend walks every day about three to four miles and runs in between, and she owns a big business, and her she's got a very high IQ, but her... Her brain capacity, her thinking, and her logic is always right on the money. So maybe there's the walking as doing the same thing to her. I mean, I, I, the way you explain it, it sounds like it to me. Now, I was in the gym today, and, and um, uh, do you go to a big gym? I, I've trained at home almost my entire life. Never, not really in the gym. So you're you're at home every day training. Right. I, I don't really. I, I would prefer to train alone. I don't need need somebody to be there with me to. Right urge me on, I urge myself on, somebody was there, I, I might be inclined to do things I shouldn't do. Well, I go... I, I, I like training alone. No, I do too, but I, I go to the gyms right by my house. It's a Gold's Gym, and it's a nice gym. But I, I'm an observer, and also I find people I want to interview out of gyms as well. But I watch, I was watching three or four guys in the gym today. I was making mental notes. Not one person was doing an exercise properly. It was completely all over the place and no focus. And these are the people that say, gee, I just can't make any progress. And they're just not even doing anything right. And I don't know what's going to inspire them. I mean, I try to correct them. I don't know if I should overstep my boundaries. But um, it's just wrong. It's just no one's ever guided them to do anything. And I've I, heard, that, heard that from a lot of people. Yeah. And one thing I... I haven't really observed this myself, but you see people in the gym for year to year. They're still doing the same thing, and their body still looks the same, yes. and they wonder, why is that? They, yeah. they don't seem to have gotten the idea of overload progression. You, you need to be giving your body reason to respond. So I, I try to plan every workout to make some improvement in some way. And if I, if I start at a sticky point, I don't just keep pushing that. I try to back off and maybe go in a little bit different direction and work back up again and always trying to find some way to improve. That's how you it, it progress is what keeps you motivated. Yeah, very simply put, if you're driving and you find a detour on a road, you take another path. And it's the same thing with your workouts. You find another path and that path works, right? Absolutely. That makes Keep. a lot of sense. Key to long-term success. Yes, I, I'm, I'm taking all this in. It's be stored in my brain. Um, well, how many books do you have out now? Ten, ten books and three DVDs. Uh, are those on your website? Absolutely. ClarenceBass.com. No, it's C Bass. They can't spell Clarence. They want to spell it Clarence. Oh, so it's CBass.com. Okay, maybe they think it's a clearance sale, right? <laughs> um, also, are you on uh, Facebook and Twitter, and do the people contact you through that? No, we're not on that, but they can contact us through the website. Okay. They can email us. We, we answer, try to answer all of our emails. Right. Uh, so we feel like we're probably as, as accessible as any bodybuilder in the field. Well, you were to me, that's for sure. I'm glad I got a hold of you. Um, what's your latest book out? Take Charge. And what's that about? I, 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 I've written those 10 books over about a 35-year period, so I, 
I, I try to be careful not to write the same book again. Yes. This Take Charge book is really a departure from what I've done before because the other books, of course, it's, it's, it's about an evolution of my training, but the other books were more about how I've changed, how I'm training, how I've changed the diet. But Take Charge is a different approach, and it's based on articles that, are, that I've written on my website. But there's so many, we're, we're finding out there's so many different ways to, to train that yeah. are successful. And so there's opportunities for people to train in a way that they enjoy. And that's the only thing that's really going to work. If you try to find something you're good at and you enjoy. And there's a number of different things that came along. One was the idea of effort-based training. We've always thought that that the key to bodybuilding success or training, getting stronger is lifting heavier weights. And they've determined you don't have to lift heavier weights. You can lift a lighter weight, do it for low reps, and the key is the effort you put in on the last few reps. And so this opens it up to many. Some people are afraid of lifting heavy weights, particularly people that are older. Right. But this was an opportunity to, to make the idea that open the gates to many more people. Another thing was they've always thought that strength training and aerobic training kind of work against each other. And, and there's new research that shows, shows that you can't have one without some of the other. And actually by combining a strength training and aerobic training, instead of that interfering, getting some cross currents there, that you do better on both. So that, that was another open, an open door there where people... They find they could be more efficient, do the two things together, right. and better results in, in a less time. Uh, that, that makes sense to me. I, I do an aerobic weight workout like a nonstop once in a while, but I don't go heavy at all. And I think you're right about going lighter and making every rep count to the very end. Uh, and when you get used to that, you change your exercise again, right? Absolutely. Um, like I said, we're not that far off in age, but I can... I feel that I could probably train the rest of my life, hopefully. Uh, I've had a lot of injuries from wrestling, and of course it's difficult at times in the shoulders and the knees and the wrists, but um, <clears throat> I go anyway and I get through it. I mean, it's, it's, if it's a lifestyle, you go and you work around everything you can because if you stay home and you don't push yourself to do something, you're going to fall apart, right? My idea is to train forever, and Bill Pearl said he's going to train until they bury him, and I've got a friend. His name is Dan Sawyer. He's a retired lawyer from Louisiana. Yeah. He plans to stop by the graveyard for stop by the gym for one more one more workout on the way to the graveyard. Yeah, exactly. That's my plan, and I think that's you know the, the, the exercise becomes more important as you get older, not less important. Yes. Because it drives everything. Your your brain works better. Your body works better. It's the key as you as you're getting older. Then I have one more question because this happens to me and it probably happened to you and a lot of guys our age. You train hard and your muscles look pretty good, but there's still an aging factor that goes with your skin slightly and with your muscle, um, I don't want to say density, maybe density a little bit. It just, no matter how hard you train and how well you eat, it just changes. Am I right or wrong? No, I, I think that's right, but I think one of my advantages is I've never been this up and down. I don't, I'm not gaining a bunch of weight. Right taking the fat off and then going up and down. So I think my skin probably is tighter because of being steady. Yes. I try to maintain a low, a good body composition throughout the year. Right. Well, I agree with that. My, you know, I think the more you train, the more you have trained, the more consistently you've trained, the more your body is going to respond and less unless you're going to succumb to the ravages of age, shall we yes, say. Yes, of course. I remember when I came here, I trained at Bill Pearl's gym in 1969. I competed at 213 pounds, uh, and I weighed myself the other day, and I was 216. I mean, that's 50 years, 40 years difference, and I've only varied from three pounds or so. I mean, I've been heavier for wrestling, but staying down. But skin tone, um, you got to take care of your skin as well as your muscle and your body. And, and here in California, there's a lot of sun. We were all living at the beach and, of course, getting skin cancer now. But um, you have to take care of it. You want to stay young with it. And everything falls together, muscle, skin, mind, the whole thing. But you certainly have set a good example for everybody. Everybody in the world knows you. Everybody in the world looks up to you, and I do as well. And I, I just feel it's an honor to talk to you. So I'm really happy that we hooked up. If you go on, on our on our website, you'll find there's a we call it a training pictorial, and it's pictures they made from 15 through 77. I saw them. 40 pictures, 
and there's a, a commentary from a professor, but his name is, her name is Juanine Spraduso. She was the author of the book called The Physical Dimensions of Aging. So she has studied the effect of, of exercise on aging. And I, I, she kind of presents me as a poster boy of what, what a regular, progressive, intelligent training and diet over the course of a lifetime can do. And I, if you look at, say, when I was winning my contest, I was in the early 40s, and and I did take steroids for some of those contests. But when I was 60, later on, you see the pictures there, I believe I looked better at 60 than I did when I was competing at 40. I saw that. I agree with you. But on to 70, I'm still looking pretty darn good, and the pictures at 77, still pretty good. So it just shows what can be done if you're regular and you apply yourself, you try to be intelligent and as we talked before, if things are hurting, you make a little adjustment. If you right. say there's, you take another path, and there's always some way to do it. And well, what has kept me going is, <clears throat> is this results, and we didn't get to this, but it, but it's a good point. But I've always tried to find some way that I can improve. So in my first 20 years of training, it was more the Olympic lifts. Yes. And when I was about 35, I felt like I topped out in the Olympic lifts, so I turned to bodybuilding. Okay. And, and I had some success there. And something else that I, I don't know, maybe in my early 50s, I found this indoor rowing, something that I could, I could improve there. And as a matter of fact, just this past weekend, I found that Concept 2 had introduced two new distances, two new sprints, one is a 100-meter sprint, and another is a one-minute sprint. The, the, the lowest, the shortest distances up to that time were 500 meters. Okay. So that gave me a new something else that I, that I felt like I could improve, improve on. And I, I'd only heard about it about, about, about 10 days ago, but this last weekend I posted my times, and that was the concept to the world ranking. You're competing with people all over the world. Yeah. All over the world. So it's people in your age category. If it's in the, in the rowing, it's also lightweight up to 65, 165. So I'm in the middle of that group for the, for the one minute. I'm a little lower on, on the, on the, uh, on the uh, 100 meter dash, which takes about 20 seconds. But something else to be enthusiastic about, something that you can improve of on. I've, I've looked at things like that over the whole course of my life, and I think that's one of been the one real secrets, if, if you can call it that. But no, I, something to be enthusiastic about. I can see that. You mentioned steroids, and and steroids have a bad name in the news and in public. And overall, I mean, over the years, I've never known anybody who had any serious effects from steroids at all. However, when you reach a certain age, your body quits producing testosterone. We know this around 40 or 45, I believe. And so my doctor has me on 200 milligrams a week of testosterone because my body isn't producing what it did when I was younger. And I definitely think it makes a difference in my training and my, my muscle and how I feel in general. Um, you're not on anything? No, uh, I've written quite a bit about this too on our website. You know, yeah. I've had my testosterone measured regularly when I go to the, the Cooper Clinic in Dallas. Yeah. And my testosterone has not been going down. Good. And I'm not taking anything. And I, but there, you hear a lot about the low T, the, all of the advertisements. Oh, sure. And I think if, you're, if, you're, if your testosterone really is down, and they, they really don't seem to be in any agreement about what is ideal. So, but if it's really down and uh, and you're having symptoms, then I think you know it's appropriate to take it. But exactly. I, I just haven't felt the need to take it so far. Well, that's very good. Well, that's the way you take care of yourself. It stays high and you're healthy, and that's all you can ask for. You look great. Well, I want to thank you for giving me your time. I'm going to put this together today and upload it and send you a copy of it. And I'm sure the fans will love hearing from you and all the uh, advice you have to give because it's good advice for any age. If we can all use it. Well, and, thank you very much. I, I've heard your name for a long time, but until until we set this up, and I kind of did a little investigation, look at your your press kit, and yeah. I, I, we've been involved in an amazing number of things, except for Arnold. I think all of the guys that came out of Gold's there that you've made more out of it than than, than just about anybody. So this is this is how you and I are alike. We're self promoters. 
We know that we have something of value to give. And at this point in my life, I love doing my show. I like the people that I work with, the people like you and the viewers. And we're giving information that will last a lifetime on the Internet that they, the younger generation can use. We're helping younger people. And so I do whatever I can to put it out there and promote myself just like you do. And the world knows, and it just takes off. So I, when you love something and you have the passion, it just works. Just has, This is how it goes. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. I enjoy it too, Clarence, and maybe we'll do a part two. But I'm going to post pictures along the way of this so people can see your progress and then your website. And I'll post the website where they can reach you and talk to you. And uh, let me know how it works out for you. We, we write new articles. We post new articles on the website every month. Okay. There's over 400 articles in 10 different categories. So we're constantly, well, I'll be talking about on for the next update about, you know, this part, this what we just did here. Right. There's some things going on and there's new things every month. So we encourage people to come to the website the first of the month, see the new things and follow along with what we're doing. I'll encourage them as well. Thank you so much for being here and thank you fans for watching Rick's Corner. Clarence Bass, amazing guest, amazing man, and I have the utmost respect for him. Thanks again. Baby, see you next time.